All right, it's Brian, and today we're going to talk about the optics of the eye, and the title of our class today is the differently vision. So we're not going to talk about vision defects. We're just going to talk about people with vision differences. And we're going to start by talking about Piggy. Now, Piggy was this character from the Lord of the Flies, and I talked about that earlier. And Piggy wore glasses, and people made fun of him for wearing glasses. They made a fun of him for being chubby and they made funny of him for being asthmatic and they also made fun of him for wearing glasses. I always felt sorry for Piggy. Anyway, they would steal his glasses and they would use his glasses to start fires. And you can see this it was a little thing here and they would use the glasses and they would focus the light of the sun, make an image of the sun. They would use that to start fires. So we're going to come back to the whole story of Piggy because I think Piggy has been misunderstood over the years. And anyway, we'll have more to say about that. But we're going to talk about the differently visioned. And if this was a regular Friday and we were in class, this would be a Freddy Friday. And, and, and the pictures on the slides would segue into a picture of Freddie Mercury. And here's a picture of Freddie Mercury. And Freddie Mercury is wearing eyeglasses as he did. But he was very sensitive about wearing glasses. And he did not wear them in public very often because um, people made fun of him for wearing glasses. They made fun of him for his teeth. They made fun of him for his religion. They made fun of him for his ethnic heritage. It was it was rough. He was a person who didn't always feel like he belonged. That's the whole point of the Freddy Fridays is to remind people that we belong, you belong. Um, but he was very sensitive about wearing glasses. And, and, and so I joke about this with like the differently vision, but I have certainly experienced over the years that people have judged me for that. But we will do that no longer after the class today. Because we're going to learn that nearsighted people in particular, and those of you who wear glasses, you're mostly nearsighted. We have superpowers. And we will get to that point at the end of class today. But before I do that, I want to do a couple of quick things from the homework assignment. Just talk about, talk about a couple of problems that I want you to think about the concepts more than the equations. And here's one, and this was a question that asked about your image in the bowl of a spoon. Now, if you look in the bowl of a spoon, it works like a converging mirror. And if you're close to it, you get a virtual image. If you're far, you get a real image. One of them is upright, one of them is inverted. That was the crux of the biscuit for this one. And next, I want to take a look at this one that has to do with sunset. And, and, and this is one that in previous years I've gotten lots of questions on. So let's, let's visualize the situation. So here you are. Okay, you're on the surface of the earth. So you're standing right here. And then there's sunset. And at sunset, like the sun is kind of coming at a low angle. Let's draw an atmosphere here. Sunlight's coming at a low angle. So sunlight's coming in like this. It's coming in near the horizon. But when a ray of light hits the upper atmosphere, it's going to refract. And it's going from atmosphere into air. And so it's going to bend to an angle that is, a, there's a smaller angle with respect to the normal. So as a consequence, what that means is I'm going to go from a big angle to a smaller angle. The rays of light are going to bend downward like so. So the rays of light come in, they bend downward. And if you trace those rays of light back and see where they appear to come from, they appear to come from a point that is higher in the sky. So if you're looking towards the sun and you're looking out in this direction towards the sun, the actual sun is actually lower than that. And so at sunset, the image of the sun is higher than the actual sun. And so as a consequence, every day, you get about two more minutes of daylight because the image of the sun set, um, is still in the sky even when the actual sun is set. This picture right here was taken after the sun had set, but the image of the sun is still above the horizon. And so here's just an optimistic thought. Every day at sunset, you get two extra minutes of sunlight. Oh, you know when else you get it? At sunrise. So every day, we get about four more inches of light, or four more minutes of light. And that happens every day. It's kind of a happy thought for today. Now let's do a couple of quick things with bringing images into focus. So suppose you have a camera focused on an object at a distance of one meter and the object has moved closer to a distance of 0.5 meters. Let's imagine we're using one of these old school cameras and I have one that I bring into class to demonstrate this. And the way you focus this camera is you move this little lens back and forth. There's a, a kind of a bellowsy thing here to kind of like help make that happen. 
So you're in focus at a distance of a meter. The objects move closer to a distance of 0.5 meters. How do you have to change the position of the lens to keep the image in focus? Think about that for a minute, and then we'll talk. Well, in a camera, this piece, that's the focal length of the lens, that stays fixed. And you've taken S and you made it lower. But since 1 over s plus 1 over s prime has to be a constant, that means s prime is going to have to get bigger. I have to take that lens and I have to move it further away from the, from the film in order to keep the image in focus. And as a matter of fact, that's what you would do. But your eye works differently. If you're focused on an object at 0.5 meters away and you move it closer to 0.5 meters, how do you have to change the power of the lens to bring the object into focus? And in your eye, what's fixed is this. We're going to use our basic relationship, where instead of having 1 over s, I just use 60. This number is fixed. If s goes down, 1 over f has to increase because this number is 60. This is just a constant. So you have to increase the power of the lens of the eye in order to bring the object back into focus. Now remember, we had this relationship for power, okay? And we have the power in diopters as 1 over the focal length in meters. This is not the same as the power that we saw before. I don't want you to get confused because we're going to see problems where we're going to be taking light and we're going to use lenses to focus it to a spot. And I might ask you about the power of the light in that spot, but that is like watts watts power. This is diopters power. It's just focusing power or refractive power, not the same as the power we saw before. So today I'm going to do some calculations and when I'm doing powers. They're always in diopters. And so as a consequence, I'm going to make my distances always be in meters. And I'm just going to skip the units because I'm going to be doing lots of calculations where I'm just throwing around lots of numbers. And so just know that today. Distances are in meters. Powers are in diopters. Remember, we had this basic model for how your eye works, okay? And it turns out when the light comes into your eye, it gets brought to a focus by this converging uh, optical system composed of your cornea plus the lens of your eye. Most of the refraction happens at the cornea surface. The power of your relaxed vision is about 60 diopters, as we've seen. About 40 diopters comes from the cornea. About 20 diopters comes from the lens. And so the heavy lifting is actually done by the cornea, and that's a point that we'll talk about more later. Now, our basic relationship for calculating images on the retina was this one right here. 1 over f is equal to 60 plus 1 over s. s is the object distance that varies. 1 over f is the power, and that will vary as s varies because s prime is fixed. We've talked about that previously. Now let's take that basic relationship and let's do some calculations with it. Okay, so 1 over f is the power of your visual system. It's equal to 60 plus 1 over s, where s is the viewing distance. So if your eye is completely relaxed, it has a power of about 60. You are in and something at a distance of infinity is in focus. You're just staring off into the distance as I'm doing right now. I'm looking up at the sky and the puffy clouds and the power of my visual system is about 60 zero diopters of accommodation, the lens of my eye is completely relaxed. If I try to look at something at a distance of one meter, I require one diopter of accommodation to give me a total power of 61 diopters. If I want to look at something at half a meter, I got to go up to 62. If I go down to a tenth of a meter, I go up to 70, and we have all these intermediate values as well. Now I want to think about what happens to your vision as you, as you age. And something that happens, and this is just a consequence of aging and happens to absolutely everybody, is that the accommodation that is possible for your eye decreases. So you folks, you're like in your 20s, you're up here, you've got about 10 diopters of accommodation or so. If you're looking at me, I'm in kind of the nether region of this curve where I have about one diopter of accommodation. So what that means is, for you folks, you have a near point of about 0.1 meters. I have a near point of about one meter, okay? And that's something which we talked about previously. But as you get older, you can see, as you get older, the accommodation of your visual system just decreases, decreases, decreases. Once you get down to being in your 40s, it drops low enough that you are going to need 
reading glasses. You are going to need reading glasses. This will happen to you as you get older and just embrace it. It's one of the things that happens as you get older. Just wear reading glasses and you will be fine. You will be fine. But some people are hesitant to accept this. Okay, my friend Lisa, and um, th this was true actually, um, she, I, we, we talked about this for years. She was like, oh man, my near point is just getting so far away. I just, I can't see close up objects anymore. And I kept saying, Lisa, get, get reading glasses. You just, just get reading glasses. There are things you can buy off the rack at the Safeway that will, will do this, that will do this. And check this out. If you look at the Safeway, it suggests as you get older and older and older, you're going to select reading glasses with higher and higher powers because as you get older and older and older, the power of your visual system, um, the accommodation gets less and less and less. But anyway, my friend Lisa finally started admitting that she had a problem and got reading glasses when her near point got to about 60 centimeters. And you had to calculate for the homework assignment what glasses would you need to see at a more comfortable distance of 25 centimeters. I want to think about the same sort of problem, but we're going to do two pieces of it. We're going to say like, if you're one of these differently visioned people like me who has so-called presbyopia, um, that is just a lack of accommodation. Oh, by the way, presbyopia, same root as presbyterian. Presbyterian means rule by elders. There are elders in the church that, that kind of like make things go. Presbyopia basically means elder eyes. Okay, it's the same root as Presbyterian, which is kind of cool. So if you have elder eyes, you don't have the same degree of accommodation. You have to wear reading glasses, but there's a problem as we will see here. So there's a sequence of questions that are asked. A woman who has never needed vision correction finds that as she ages, her near point grows to one meter, too distant for comfortable reading. Her distance vision is still quite good. She wants to read at a more reasonable distance to 25 centimeters. What power lens would she need in her reading glasses? And then the next piece of the puzzle is with this lens in place, what is her new far point? Now I want you to do this as a sequence of steps. So first off, um, calculate this. Her distance vision is good. Her far point is infinity. What is the minimum power of her visual system when her eye is relaxed? Next, given the near point noted, what is the maximum power of her visual system? Then what power would she need to put her near point at 25 centimeters? What lens would she need to put her near point at 25 centimeters? And with that lens in place, what is the minimum power of her visual system when her eye is relaxed with the lens in place? And given that, what is her far point if she has the glasses on? So there's a sequence of steps for you to go through. And if we were doing this in class, I would do this as a many step process that you would do as a big picture exercise. I want you just to stop and I want you to go through step by step by step and go through these different pieces and see what you get. So go ahead and take a break. I'll be back. Now let's go ahead and work this out. Okay, and let's go through the steps that you would do to get here. So first off, we were, we we're going to figure out the power of her visual system. Her distance vision is still quite good. So for distance vision, she's looking at something at infinity. So our basic relationship, 1 over f, is equal to 60 plus 1 over infinity. The power of her visual system is 60 when her vision is relaxed. Okay? But she wants, and her near point is 1 meter. Okay? So at her near point, <clears throat> the power of her visual system is equal to 60 plus 1 over the distance, 1 over 1 meter, it's 61. So her, her accommodation spans the range from 60 to 61. That's all she's got. So she gets a pair of reading glasses. She wants her near point to be 25 centimeters. So she wants... 60 plus 1 over 0.25. She wants to have a power of 64. She has a power of 61. She wants a power of 64. To get from 61 to 64, she needs a power of plus 3 diopters. That's the power of the lens that she needs. Okay. Now, here's, here's the, the trick though. 
with this lens in place, what is her new far point? So let's go back to her far point. And her far point now, when her eye is completely relaxed, it has a power of 60, but she stuck a lens of three diopters in front of it. So the power of a visual system is 63 when it's totally relaxed. It goes from 63 to 64. So at her far point, she's completely relaxed her vision. Her eye has a power of 60, but her reading glasses has a power of three. The power of a visual system is 63. Her near point, and we calculate that this way, the power of the visual system is equal to 60 plus one over S. I get S is equal to 0 0.33 meters. So her near point, when the power is 64, her near point is 0.25 meters. That's the closest she can see. Her far point is 0.33 meters. So she can see everything between a quarter of a meter away and a third of a meter away. That's a very narrow range, but that's okay. You're doing that to read and you stick the book in that range. Everything's good. Everything's good. And I'm going to solve problems generally this way. And we're going to take a look at these steps. First off, we're going to compute what the person has, compute what she wants, what she needs, but then there's also what she gets. So her current visual system, she has a power of 60 that goes up to a power of 61 at her near point. She wants a near point of 64. She needs a land, conversion lens of, of plus three diopters, but for the far point that gives her a power of 63, which gives her a power of point, uh, a far point of 0.33 meters. That's the way we're going to sum this up. Okay, does that all make sense? Excellent, we shall move on. But before we do it, I want to mention this. Here's a picture of Brad Pitt. Oh, by the way, Brad Pitt wearing reading glasses. Even Brad Pitt is not above realizing that as he's getting older, he is going to need reading glasses to see um, at a reasonable distance. And you can see he's looking over the top of his glasses. And why do you do that? You do that because he, when he's got those reading glasses on, his numbers are probably like the previous slide. His near point is 0.25 meters. His far point is 0.33 meters. That's no good. So you look through the glasses when you're looking near, you look above the glasses when you're looking far. And that gives you near vision and far vision. And so you're going to look over the top of your glasses. That's why people do it. It's not just to look intimidating, although it probably does. Now I want to talk about another vision difference, and that is myopia. If you're myopic, what happens is the eye focuses rays from a distant object in front of the retina. So here's the typical numbers for a myopic person. If a myopic person has a near point of 10 centimeters and a far point of 20 centimeters, question asks this, what power lens will correct his vision? And first off, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what he has, okay? And then you're going to calculate what he wants and then calculate what he needs. I want you to take a minute, do a calculation like we did for presbyopia. I'll be back. Well, let's figure out first off what he has. Okay, so let's do the near point. At the near point, the power of the visual system, okay, one over F is equal to 60 plus 10 centimeters. I'm gonna put it in meters. So we end up with the near point, the power of the visual system is 70. At the far point, the power of the visual system is equal to 60 plus one over 0 0.20 meters, 65. Now, that's what he has. Next up, we're gonna compute what he wants. He would like the far point to be infinity. You want your far point to be infinity. And if you're nearsighted, if you're myopic, what you correct is the far point. Near point's fine. A 10 centimeter near point is delightful. A far point at 20 centimeters, not so delightful. So he's going to fix the far point. To fix the far point, what he wants is 1 over f is equal to 60 plus 1 over infinity, which is just 60. So what he has is 65. What he wants is 60. He's got to go from 65 to 60. The lens that's necessary is negative 5 diopters. So he needs a diverging lens. 
And the reason is because the power of the lens is too great. The lens is too strong. You have to add a diverging lens to kind of like beat back the power a little bit. So the person needs a pen lens of power, negative five diopters. But there's a, there's a downside. We've calculated what he has, what he, what he wants, what he needs. But now let's look at what he gets. And so with this calculation, near point, far point, added a lens of negative five diopters with the lens in place, what is his new near point? I want you to take a minute. I want you to calculate that. I'll be back. Now the near point was 10 centimeters. Okay, and we saw that the power of his visual system went from 65 up to 70. So at the near point, the power of the visual system is 70. Here's the thing. It's not 70 anymore because we added to that a lens of negative five diopters. So at the near point, when the lens is as accommodated as it can be, the power is now 65. So if the power of the visual system is 65, 65 is equal to 60 plus one over S, what you get is S is equal to 0 0.20 meters or 20 centimeters. So we're wearing the glasses of negative five diopters brings the far point from 20 centimeters out to infinity, but it also takes the near point from 10 centimeters out to 20 centimeters so it reduces the near vision and that's the cost but here's the thing if you said okay brian right now you can see everything between 10 and 20 centimeters away if you put in these glasses you can see everything from 20 centimeters to infinity I, you've lost the 10 to 20 range but you've gained the rest of the world i say yeah that's a bargain give me that i will take that so here's the way we sum it up. What he has at the near point, power of 70, at the far point, 65. What he wants is a power of 60, needs 0.5 diopters, I'm sorry, negative five diopters, which gives him a power of 65 at the near point. And so he has, his distance of his near point is now 0.2 meters. So now I wanna talk about the superpowers that nearsighted people have. First off, you know, when I was a kid, I wore glasses. I was myopic and people was, would say like, oh, you're wearing glasses. Your eyes are too weak. Oh, no, 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 no. If you are nearsighted and you're wearing glasses, that means the lens in your eye is too strong. It has to be handicapped with a diverging lens. Your eye lens has super strength. Your eye lens has super strength. So it's not because your eyes are weak. It's because they're too damn strong. And nearsighted people, which is more than half the class, rejoice in that. Now, if you're nearsighted, like me, and you, you, you're wearing your glasses, when you're wearing your glasses, your near point, you, your near point goes further away. But here's the thing, I can take off my glasses and I can see better. And when I take off my glasses, my near point is significantly closer. And that's a second superpower that the nearsighted people have. They have a built-in magnifier. Take off your glasses, you have super close vision. And this totally works for me. You saw that my near point was about a meter away. But if I take off my glasses, my near point is about 10 centimeters away. I can get things about 0 0.10 meters away. It's comparable to yours. So my near vision is not good with my glasses on, but all I have to do is take my glasses off and I am good to go. I am good to go. I can use my built-in magnifier for my super, super close vision. That's superpower number two of us nearsighted people. Now, if you look at this image, this is an image of like points of light, I don't know, like light sparkling on water or something like that. It was taken like that. The shutter of the camera looked like this. And so what you're seeing is there's a bunch of images of the shutter of the camera. And this is perhaps the coolest thing of all that nearsighted people can do. If you are nearsighted and you look at a distant point light source, and I was thinking that this distant point on the black screen would work. It doesn't really. In class, I would hold up a, a, a flashlight with a, with a bare bulb and I would let people look at it. 
If you're nearsighted and you take off your glasses and you look at a distant point light source and you probably have a bunch of like glowing LEDs on electronics, etc., etc., in your place, look at a distant point light source. What you'll see is not the point. You're going to be seeing something that's kind of like bigger and kind of like fuzzier. And if you're me, it looks kind of like fuzzy around the edges and it's kind of elliptically shaped. I see something like this when looking at a distant point light source. And what I'm actually seeing is an image of my pupil. And I can tell that because if I'm looking at a distant light and I'm seeing the image of my pupil, if I close my eyes and then open them, the pupil gets bigger and so does the image, which is kind of awesome. And then I can watch it shrink. And so I look at a distant point light source, I open and close my eyes, and I watch the image of my pupil change. It is an awesome, awesome thing. And this is something that only the nearsighted people can do. So if you're nearsighted, I want you to give that a shot. And you can actually use that to observe structures in your eye. If you're nearsighted and you look at a different point light source, you have seen this before. You have seen floaters. You have seen little things that are in your eye. And you can also see the edge of your iris. I see kind of like a jagged edge image, and that's because your pupil is not like a hard, sharp edge. It's a jagged edge because your iris is kind of a jaggedy edge. The other thing you can do if you slowly blink your eye, you can see an image of the eyelashes as they go in front of your eye. So nearsighted people, take off your glasses. You gotta you get, try this at night. Take off your glasses, look at a distant point light source. I use a street light on my street or I use glowing LEDs on electronics in the house. I look at them and I open and close my eyes. I can see images at the edge of my iris. I can see floaters and I can see the eyelashes of my eyes when I close, slowly close them. Give that a shot. Very cool. You can also use pinholes to make images. As we talked about, here's a picture of a solar eclipse and we view the image through a colander. That's one of the things you use to strain spaghetti and so you get the multiple images like so. You can see that this is images of the partially eclipsed sun. And you can use this to crisp up your vision. Now, if I take my glasses off and I put up an eye chart, I cannot see the big E on the eye chart. And in class, I put this up on the screen, I can't see the big E. With my glasses on, you know, I can see, I can see all the way down the chart. I can see, you know, comfortably down to here easily with my glasses on. With my glasses off, I can't even see the big E. That doesn't work, but there's a trick I can play and that's this. I can squint. And why does squinting make your vision sharper. I want you to think about that for a minute. I'll be back. Squinting makes your vision sharper because I'm making kind of a smaller aperture here. When we get the smaller aperture, I get the pinhole focusing. A pinhole by itself would produce focus. But I'm getting, I'm, what it will do, it will increase kind of the focusing power of the system of my eye because the focusing of the pinhole and the focusing of the lens work together to give me a crisper image. My wife, when she was a kid, used to do this kind of like awesome thing where she would, um, she needed glasses too. Um, she would look at the board in the classroom and she would take her fingers and put them in front of her eye and make a little hole like that. And so she had discovered that that allowed her to see the board because she put a pinhole in front of her eye and she was good to go. She could see the board. That was pretty awesome. Um, it also kind of like triggered a parent teacher conference because if you have a kid in class and they're doing that, like, the teachers are wondering what the heck is this kid doing? Um, anyway, but uh, they, they asked Carol, like, what are you up to? And she said, I'm just trying to see clearly. And I can see clearly and we look through here. And what they did is they got her glasses and the story had a happy ending because then she met a man with glasses and we fell in love and got married. And that was awesome. But, and <laughs> she used to do this and I do this sometimes and I get up in the middle of the night, I get up in the middle of the night and I need to read a clock or something like that. I can do boop, a little pinhole and I'm good to go. Question for you, I want you to think about Using a bright reading light actually makes your vision sharper, especially if you have any vision difference. Why would that be true? I want you to take a minute and cogitate. I'll be back. Well, of course, if you're using a bright reading light, what's going to happen is the pupil in the front of your eye is going to go from being big to being small. And when the pupil goes from being big to being small, you get a little bit more pinhole focusing. You can see more clearly in bright light. 
than you can in dim light because you get the pinhole focusing of the smaller pupil. This is one of my favorite <laughs> stories to tell. Um, whenever I teach about this stuff in class, um, people come up and tell me about things that they've learned about. And someone told me about, you can get so-called natural vision correction on the internet. And people sell glasses that look like this. And they've got, instead of having lenses, they've got these little holes. And the little holes will give you pinhole focusing. And if I take my glasses off and I wear these glasses, I get this kind of pixelated view of the world, but the images are crisper. I can see, I actually can read, et, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's a kind of weird because it's pixely, but I can make my way through the world, um, a bit, albeit a bit precariously. But these are marketed as natural vision correction. And the people who sell these say, if you wear glasses, it actually makes your eyes worse. Now that's not true, but if they say, if you wear glasses, it makes your eyes worse, here's their proof. Look at all the people you know who are wearing glasses. They have problems with their vision. Their vision needs correction. And I, I think the actual causality arrow goes the other way. Because your vision has problems, you wear glasses, but they're claiming that, no, no, it's wearing glasses that makes your visions bad. Don't use that artificial refractive vision correction. Use this all natural refraction free vision correction. And it is, of course, um, hokum, but um, it's kind of interesting. Now, remember what we said about the eye. We talked about the fact that most of the refraction happens at the cornea surface. And I said that 40 diopters of the focusing comes from the bending of the cornea. 20 diopters comes from the light going through the lenses, mostly about the cornea. So here's a question for you. In water, are you nearsighted or are you farsighted? Okay. I want you to think about that and I'll be back. If you're in the water, the focusing power of your cornea is reduced. So you have 40 diopters from the cornea plus 20 diopters from your lens. This number decreases. And so as a consequence, the overall power of your visual system goes down. That makes you farsighted. That makes you farsighted. But here's the thing. If you're nearsighted, the power of your visual system is too great. <coughs> You need to reduce it. And one way you can reduce it is by wearing glasses. The other way you can reduce it is getting in water. And it turns out, and this is really true, nearsighted people have better underwater vision. My vision underwater is actually pretty okay because when I go underwater, um, it reduces the power of my visual system. That is exactly what my glasses do. Going underwater is like putting on my glasses. It's a little too much. But actually, my underwater vision is significantly better than those of my friends who don't, do not need vision correction. And if you're nearsighted, this is something we can do. Now, I want to think about this. Suppose you're going to, you have someone who's myopic, so the power of the visual system is too great, and you want to correct it. You can, you can do surgery to correct the shape, to, to change the shape of the cornea, and you can correct that particular vision difference. You can take the image and make it appear right on the retina. How would you have to change the shape of the cornea to make that happen? I want you to think about that. Take a minute. I'll be back. And if you are nearsighted and you're thinking about having this done, I want you to think about this first. If you have your vision corrected, you are giving up your superpowers. You are giving up your superpowers so that you can be like all the other people, other people who don't need to wear glasses in the world. Should you willingly give up your superpowers? I want to ask that question. But here's the thing, you can have surgery to correct and what you want to do is you want to take your, your cornea and you want to make it flatter and if it's flatter there's less focusing and that will reduce the power of your visual system and correct your vision. I want to think about another vision difference that people have and that's hyperopia. Hyperopia is known as farsightedness. If you're hyperopic, the power of your visual system is too small. And typically what that means is your far point is great because the low powers, you're, 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 you're nailing it. But the near point, you want to have the higher powers. You can't access the higher powers for a close near point. And so as a consequence, you're going to have to supplement the power of your visual system with a lens. So far-sighted women with a near point of 0.5 meters, 
buys a chair pair of cheap reading glasses labeled points two. What is her near point when she's wearing these glasses? I want you to think about how you'd calculate that. I'll be back. And we use the same basic relationship that one over F, the power of the visual system is equal to 60 plus one over S. And first we'll compute what the person has. And what she has, near point, point 0.5, that gives her the power of the visual system is 62. But to that, she adds a power of plus two diopters. And so at her near point, the power of a visual system is now 64. If you have a power of 64, what point can you focus on? And if we calculate that, we get a near point of 0.25 meters. So her new near point is 0.25 meters. So by adding two diopters of correction, she brings it in from 50 centimeters to 25 centimeters, which is an improvement. And to make this happen, you have to have glasses which have plus power. They are converging lenses with a positive power. If you are farsighted, your glasses are converging lenses. They are converging lenses. And as a consequence, they also work like magnifiers. And so you can see it's kind of like magnify the images of this person's eyes. Um, my grandmother um, had cataract surgery, and they used to do that by removing the lens of your eye. Um, they used to correct cataracts by just removing the lens of your eye rather than replacing it. And um, so she needed like a 20 diopter lens to be able to see. And so when you looked at her, it just made her eyes look really, really huge. And when she would blink, it was kind of quite startling. Um, that This is a picture of, of my grandmother. And um, she was a lovely, lovely, sweet woman. But it was kind of interesting talking with her when she, because you would, her eyes just seemed really huge. And when she would blink, it was kind of intimidating. Now, glasses for nearsightedness are diverging lenses. Converging lenses make things appear bigger because you're looking at a virtual image through the lens. Diverging lenses make things appear smaller. You're looking at a virtual image through the lens. And you can tell that if I look at someone who's nearsighted, look at the side of her face. It's right here. But through the glasses, it looks like it's here. So this jump that it takes inward tells me this person is nearsighted. And actually, this person is strongly nearsighted. I can tell by looking at you what your approximate prescription is. Because as your prescription goes up, so does this distance right here. And I can tell within a diopter what people's prescription is just by looking at you. So how about this person right here? Are they nearsighted or farsighted? Take 15 seconds. Okay, that's not 15 seconds, but I'm impatient. So here's the person's face, and then the line of the face appears here. This person is nearsighted, but only slightly nearsighted. I would guess this was a correction of about negative two diopters, and that's a pretty chill prescription. That's not too much at all. How about this person? And of course, if you look at the line of the face, it's here, and then it's here. It's bigger. These are converging lenses. This person is farsighted. And actually, if I look at the top, it's kind of even. So this probably got farsighted correction down here and nothing up here because in addition to being farsighted, this person might also have, this might be a person that has presbyopia. And so they're just correcting their near vision down below and they look to the top of the glasses and they have no correction. If you're looking for people who you can find images of who are super nearsighted, um, and, and I did a, an image search for this, the, 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 the most I could find was Hillary Clinton. And check this out, like here's the line of her face. Oh my gosh, and it's all the way over here. This is crazy. Hillary Clinton is like ridiculously nearsighted as it turns out, which is kind of a, kind of a remarkable thing. Now take a look at this person. Are they nearsighted or are they farsighted? And the answer is neither. The lenses in these glasses do not change the position of her cheek. So as a consequence, those are not lenses. Those are just pieces of glass. She's just wearing glasses. And why would you wear glasses? And when I ask this in class and say, if someone's in the movies and you see this all the time, and it really makes me mad when I see someone wearing glasses that aren't real glasses, and you can tell easily because you look at their face, the line's just going like this. You say like, those aren't real glasses. Those aren't real glasses. Those are just glass with glass in it. Glasses with glass in it. They're not lenses. Why would you stick glasses on someone? And what people always say is sticking glasses on people makes people look smarter makes people look smarter now 
where did that old trope come from? Wearing glasses makes people look smarter. I want to show you something. This is data on a wide range of people of, across all kinds of different socioeconomic levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're looking at the average refractive correction versus a person's IQ. Now IQ, I don't know what that's a measure of, actually. I, I think I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but anyway, if you look, people in the top quartile of IQ need significantly more vision correction than people in the bottom quartile. And there's this link between intelligence and nearsightedness, intelligence as measured by IQ tests, okay? And here's the thing, if I look at the Physics 122 class, you are a group of people who's pretty clever, who's worked pretty hard. Look at your vision corrections, and this is a previous year, obviously I couldn't do your year because um, I, I haven't been able to kind of like assess people in class. More than half of you are nearsighted. If you look at people in the world and ask like what fraction of people are nearsighted, it's less than 10%. So what's different about your class? What's different about your class? Now I want to think about this. There is this correlation between nearsightedness and people scores on IQ tests. The best predictor of how you do on IQ tests is how many books did you read when you were a kid? And if you read a lot of books, you tend to do better on IQ tests. And if you're do, reading a lot of books, you're doing a lot of close work, you're focusing closer. For people who have a tendency in that direction, it can tend to make you nearsighted. That's the, nearsighted. The act of doing the close work, there's some evidence that that can cause nearsightedness. So it could be that for you folks, doing lots of close work when you're in college, you're spending a lot of time looking at books and looking at screens, that actually for the people who have a tendency in that direction, it could make you nearsighted. So all the study that you've done has, in, has made you, you know, kind of like more capable people, but it also has quite possibly made you more nearsighted which is kind of an interesting thing. So there's something interesting going on, but it's probably, and if, and, and, and this, but there's something to the idea that certainly people who are more educated are more apt to be more nearsighted. And it seems to be a causality from doing all the close work. Now, I wanna think about Piggy. So Piggy was myopic. They actually said that in the book. Piggy was myopic. He sat expressionless behind the luminous wall of his myopic. The optical system of his eye was too strong. What kind of corrective lens does he need in order to fix his vision? If he's myopic, what kind of lens would he have to wear in his glasses? And you know what he has to have is he has to have a diverging lens. He has to have a diverging lens. And if you're myopic, you have diverging lenses. You can't use diverging lenses to start fires. We nearsighted people have all kinds of superpowers, but one superpower we do not possess is we cannot use our glasses to start fires. You would have to find a farsighted person for that. Um, our glasses spread the rays of light out. They don't bring it together. So Piggy was killed so that people could get his glasses. How sad, because his glasses wouldn't have actually worked to do what they were supposed to do after all. Now let's come back and think about Piggy. And in the book, The Lord of the Flies, they made fun of Piggy because he was myopic. They made fun of him because he was asthmatic. And they made fun of him because he was chubby. And, and we know that you shouldn't make fun of people because of their differences, but we know that children can be cruel and, and, and things like this do happen, but we know we shouldn't. And there have been great strides in our society at pushing back against this kind of bullying. But I want to think about Piggy and what does this really mean? Well, first off, I want to think about the name. They're calling him Piggy, but I think pigs are smart and they're sociable and they're kind of awesome. So, so I don't think that's a a name to denigrate anybody. That seems like an awesome name. Pigs are, pigs are awesome. I really have met a couple of pigs in my life who are just rather clever and rather sociable and kind of awesome. But let's think about this. He's myopic, he's nearsighted. What that means is the lens in his eye is very strong. He's asthmatic. And if you have asthma, it's an immune system thing. And it means your immune system is attacking stuff it has no business attacking. Your immune system is very vigorous. If you're chubby, what that means is you're taking those calories and you're storing them for later. You're getting by with less than other people and you actually have the ability to do a reserve. Your metabolism is very efficient. This is true. If you look at people who are a little bit overweight, 
um, their metabolisms are actually more efficient than for other people. So Piggy, his lens in his eye is very strong, super strength. Immune system, super strength. Metabolism, super strength. Piggy is an unappreciated superhero. And his superpowers give him these surface things which actually look like they are weaknesses, but if you dig below the surface, they are strengths. And this is intended to be lighthearted, but Piggy was different. And, but we know this, rather than ridiculing, demonizing, ostracizing people who are, who are different, we need to accept people and not just accept people's differences. We need to celebrate those differences because, and you know this is true, our differences can be our strengths. And we know this is true. Now, there's actually interesting research data that says if you have a group, if you have a really difficult problem that you need to solve and you have to pick a team to throw at it, what team do you throw at it? You throw at it the most diverse team that you can get. Because if you throw a diverse team at it, you're gonna get different points of view, you're gonna get different perspectives, you're gonna get different skills, and that is just gonna give you more avenues for solving the problems. Our differences are to be celebrated because it is those differences that as a, as a, as a planet, as a species, as a country, as a university community make us stronger. Our differences are not to be feared. Our differences are to be celebrated there, be, to be embraced. It is our differences that make us strong. It is our diversity that makes us strong. And I want you, you know this, you as a generation understands that lesson better than any group of students I have ever taught. So I'm just reminding you of something you already know. And let's let let that be our closing lesson for today. And next time, we're going to do some review and some synthesis and talk about why pirates wear eye patches. Thanks much.